Mad Money, the curious case of billionaire film director Howard Hughes. Was he really insane? Howard Hughes crammed a lot into his 70 years. Hughes was born into money as a result of his father inventing a rotary bit for oil well drilling, which gained his small family a considerable fortune, and he inherited the lion's share when both of his parents died when he was a teenager. It would be an understatement to suggest that Hughes was an ambitious eccentric. Money, as history has shown, has a tendency to drive people insane. And when the individual in issue is already on the verge of overdoing it, like Hughes was, it doesn't take much to tip them over the brink. Hughes' estate attorney requested a psychological autopsy after his death in 1976, and it was determined that many of the phobias and eccentricities that plagued him throughout his life could be attributed to his upbringing, as well as the fact that his mother encouraged him to isolate himself and instilled her own fears in him. Despite his difficulties, he remains one of the most intriguing people of his time. He might have let his freak flag fly even higher if he had realized that one day he would be performed on the big screen by Leonardo DiCaprio as they were in 2004's The Aviator. In today's video, we take a look into the life of this billionaire, his life, genius, and infamous eccentricity. So get your favorite drink, sit back, and get ready to be amazed. Remember to go clickety-clack on the like button and do a tap dance on the notification bell so you get immediately notified when we release new videos on the channel. Hughes was an orphan at an early age. Born on the 24th of December, 1905, Howard Hughes had a privileged childhood. His father, Howard R. Hughes Sr., was an ex-outlaw oil wildcatter who gained a fortune after inventing a drill bit used in the oil industry and invested the proceeds in the establishment of his own company, Hughes Tools Co. According to the BBC, his mother, Aline Stogano, was a, quote, Dallas DeBonte and the aristocratic granddaughter of a Confederate major. Hughes lost his mother when he was 16, describing her as very beautiful and very weird in the book Howard Hughes, The Untold Story by Peter Harry Brown and Pat Broas. She died as a result of complications from an ectopic pregnancy. Hughes' father died two years later after having a major heart attack, leaving Hughes as an orphan, although a very wealthy one. According to Entrepreneur, he inherited an estate of nearly $1 million in 1924 at the age of 18, but he would not have full access to it until he was 21. According to the biography Howard Hughes, The Mysterious Billionaire, after his father died, he turned down any offers of assistance from family members and went to court to have himself proclaimed as an adult. To gain major control of his father's firm, he offered large sums of money to every relative who had a stake in it. This power grab from Hughes would be the first of many. Hughes came by his weirdness rather naturally. Howard Hughes's name has become virtually synonymous with the word eccentric, and much of the man's eccentricities and phobias can be traced back to his mother. According to the memoir Howard Hughes, The Untold Story, Hughes had a quote, emotionally incestuous relationship with his mother, which contributed to his virtually paralyzing obsessive compulsive illness. Hughes' phobias were caused by his mother's extreme worry about germs and obsession with her son's health, when he was growing up according to a psychological autopsy performed after his death. According to the book Howard Hughes, His Life and Madness, Hughes idolized his mother and didn't spend a night away from her until he was 10 years old, and his father thought it best to send him off to summer camp. His mother, terrified about her son being away from her and exposed to germs, became preoccupied with the possibility of him acquiring polio while at camp, and wrote many intrusive letters to the camp staff voicing her concerns. According to the book, his mother checked him for infections every day and was quite particular about what he ate. She's believed to have kept a close eye on his feet, teeth, and bowel movements, and would rush him to the doctor if anything worried her. Howard Hughes was obsessive when it came to cinema. Around 1926, Hughes began dabbling in the film industry, forming RKO Pictures with a sizable portion of its riches. The Racket was one of his first films and was released in 1928 and was nominated for Outstanding Picture at the 1929 Academy Awards, but lost to Wings star Gary Cooper. This film, along with two other early Hughes movies, Two Arabian Nights and The Maiden Call, were considered to be lost, but copies of each were recovered in Hughes' vault after his death. Hell's Angels was Hughes' most ambitious film project and cost him a lot of money and stress. Hughes directed the film which was released in 1930, and it cost $3.95 million to make, the equivalent of around $70 million today. The production of Hell's Angels was fraught from the start. Three pilots died while filming, large portions of the picture had to be reshot when cinema switched from silent to talkies, and the project took three years to finish. Hell's Angels was shot in black and white, save for one 8-minute two-strip multicolor segment, which according to IMDb, is the sole surviving color footage of the film's lead, Gene Harlow. According to Wired, Hughes was a film obsessive who would lock himself off from the world for months on end, in his own screening room, naked, while eating candy bars and sipping on milk. 
his love for the cinema was second only to his love for aviation. Hughes, then 28, won his first racing prize in a custom-modified Boeing 100A airplane in 1934. According to Spartan College of Aeronautics and Technology, he went on to build the Hughes Aircraft Company, which he launched in hangar space rented from Lockheed and eventually bought a major airline, TWA, in 1939. When World War II broke out, Hughes got concerned with designing military aircraft capable of transporting troops and supplies across the Atlantic Ocean. The Hughes H-4 Hercules, sometimes known as the Spruce Goose, a nickname Hughes despised, was the largest wooden airplane ever built as a result of his effort. Hughes spent $18 million of his own money on the plane, which was made of laminated birch rather than spruce because the use of metals was restricted during the war and the United States coughed up the remaining $22 million. By the time the plane was finished, the war had ended and it was no longer useful. The spruce goose was only ever flown a mile by Hughes and it was never flown again. It is now the focal point of the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum in Oregon. According to the authors of the book, Howard Hughes, The Untold Story, when Hughes was dying, he told an aide, quote, I hope I'm remembered for my aviation achievements. I don't want the biographers digging up all the women. Howard Hughes had an intense fear of germs. Perhaps the most well-known fact about Howard Hughes is he was an extreme, almost comical germaphobe. A psychiatric autopsy performed after his death indicated that he went to extraordinary measures to avoid becoming ill. Hughes is claimed to have walked around with Kleenex boxes on his feet and slept naked in hotel rooms in the dark, believing that it was the best way to prevent coming into contact with contaminants. It's also stated that if someone got too close to Hughes, he'd burn the clothes he was wearing. The psychiatrist called on Hughes's estate attorney to undertake the psychiatric autopsy. APA CEO Raymond D. Fowler, PhD, sifted through Hughes's letters, read stories about him, and questioned his former workers. In his words, quote, a picture gradually emerged of a young child who was pretty much isolated and had no friends, and a man who increasingly became concerned about his own health. During Fowler's interviews with Hughes's former employees, he discovered that Hughes required them to wash their hands multiple times and then line them with paper towels before passing him food. Hughes, ironically, abandoned personal hygiene near the end of his life, refusing to bathe or wash his teeth. He didn't believe that germs could come from him, just from the outside, explains Fowler. He was convinced that he was going to be contaminated from the outside. Raymond D. Fowler, PhD, the psychologist tasked with studying Howard Hughes' mental problems after his death, pieced together a distressing character profile of a tormented man. Hughes discovered his OCD expressed in some extremely strange ways after chatting with employees and associates who were exposed to his daily peculiarities. According to Fowler's report, Hughes prepared a guidebook for his workers on how to open a can of peaches and serve it in a dish in a very exact way. They were told to open the can, remove the label, scrub it until the bare metal was visible, wash it again, then pour the peaches into a serving bowl, being cautious not to let the can touch the bowl. According to a BBC feature report on Hughes, he was known to wash his hands so frequently that they began to bleed. He was also known to worry over the smallest details in his film and aviation ventures, even down to the type of bras and underwear that his female stars wore. During the filming of the western The Outlaw, Hughes is said to have made the special bra for Jane Russell to further showcase her already very ample breasts. But she's later quoted as saying she tricked him into thinking she worked during filming, knowing that he wouldn't be brave enough to physically check. According to the Philadelphia Inquirer, after Howard Hughes died in 1976 from kidney failure, it was discovered that he had been consuming, quote, large doses of narcotic and painkilling medicines for many years. The medications were allegedly obtained illegally, wrecked havoc on his kidneys, and finally contributed to his death. Hughes was 6'4 in his prime and reported to have weighed around 150 pounds. However, when he died, he tipped the scales at barely 94 pounds. Following Hughes' death, an inquiry was conducted and it was determined that several members of his staff were responsible for illegally procuring medicines for him. According to the New York Times, his personal physician, Dr. Norman Crane, and an aide named John M. Holmes were, quote, accused of agreeing to utilize illicit prescriptions written by Dr. Crane to purchase codeine that Mr. Holmes would give to Mr. Hughes. Both were indicted by a federal grand jury in Las Vegas, where the Drug Enforcement Administration discovered that Dr. Crane issued 488 prescriptions under various identities to keep Hughes supplied. Hughes allegedly began taking codeine after suffering injuries in a crash of a plane he constructed in 1946. Howard Hughes lived in seclusion for quite some time. There's a reason Hughes was dubbed as one of the top 10 most reclusive celebrities by time. Hughes' hearing impairments, which he had fought since boyhood, and severe mental concerns prompted him to isolate, hiding out for months on end in any of the hotels he owned. According to author Charles Higgum in the book Howard Hughes' The Secret Life, 
When residing at the Beverly Hills Hotel, he grew fascinated with flies and would sometimes hire workers eight-hour shifts solely to keep the insects away from him. Hughes would sit in his room naked, sometimes with a Kleenex diaper on his diaper and Kleenex boxes on his feet, batting flies away and obsessing over germs. When he wasn't in a hotel, Hughes would retreat to his secret movie studio and eat chocolate bars and milk with his hands wrapped in Kleenex. As if that wasn't enough, he's reportedly said to have avoided any doorknobs, preferring to open doors by kicking them, and to avoid dirty toilets by urinating on the floor or into buckets. Hughes's relationship with women were strange to say the least. Howard Hughes's interactions with women were anything but average, beginning with his odd relationship with his own mother. According to Howard Hughes' The Secret Life, his approach to sex was not romantic, but rather perceived as a means of control or relief, similar to scratching an itch or sneezing. Despite having been married twice, and being said to be continuously dating when he wasn't, and sometimes even when he was, Hughes didn't seem to care about developing genuine bonds with anyone he slept with. Hughes initially married Ella Botts Rice, who Karina Longworth, author of Seduction, Sex, Lies, and Stardom in a Howard Hughes Hollywood, described as, quote, a Texan society belle. According to a Washington Post story about the book, Hughes's marriage was not a love match, but rather a strategy for Hughes to enhance his business activities. After his divorce from Rice, Hughes married actress Jean Peters, with whom he had 14 turbulent years, during which Hughes focused largely on keeping Peters under his control. According to a Telegraph piece on the pair, Hughes would limit Peters' spending and drinking, and would even pay security detail to follow her around so he always knew what she was up to. Hughes was reported to have had dated nearly every prominent actress of that day, including Betty Davis, Katharine Hepburn, Ava Gardner, and Rita Hayworth, but he was never lucky in love. Howard Hughes really liked banana nut ice cream. Gordon Margulis, Howard Hughes' personal aide, was present at many of his outbursts. Jeff Schumacher, author of Howard Hughes, Power, Paranoia, and Palace Intrigue, stated in an article for the Las Vegas Review Journal that Margulis was an important source for his book and told him an interesting story involving Hughes and a certain ice cream. Margulis claimed that he was enamored with Baskin Robbins' banana nut ice cream when he was in charge of Hughes' food deliveries. Margulis claimed that he would buy enormous quantities of the ice cream to keep on hand at whatever hotel Hughes was staying at, and when they ran out, they would go to Baskin Robbins for more. Then, one day they were informed that the flavor had been discontinued. They had to go straight to the source, a Baskin Robbins location, and were told they couldn't obtain any unless they purchased 350 gallons, which they did. In a passage out of Schumacher's book, he writes, quote, The banana nut ice cream was made in Los Angeles and two Hughes aides transported it to Las Vegas in a refrigerated truck. It was stored in the Desert Inn's restaurant freezer. Problem solved. But that night, Hughes announced that it was time for a change and he wanted French vanilla. It took the hotel a year to get rid of the 350 gallons of banana nut ice cream. Hughes was part of a CIA plot to recover a sunken Soviet submarine. In a surprising turn of events, Hughes became involved with the CIA in the search for a missing Soviet submarine with nuclear missiles that sank in 1968, killing 98 personnel on board, according to NPR. The Soviets searched for the submarine unsuccessfully for two months, at which point the United States, with a vested interest in recovering the missiles and any other intelligence found aboard, set out to find it themselves in a project dubbed Project Azorian, with the help of an unlikely partner, Howard Hughes. According to reports, Hughes stepped in to build a one-of-a-kind ship called the Hughes Glamour Explorer, which was outfitted with a submersible vehicle and a massive claw to capture the Soviet sub from where it had sunk, according to the NPR feature. Hughes established a cover for the project by pretending the Explorer was being used to mine manganese nodules on the seafloor, keeping the actual mission hidden. It is estimated that the project cost hundreds of million dollars and took six years to finish. The Soviet submarine was finally recovered, but it had split in half and had to be transported in sections. Howard Hughes came out of seclusion to dispute a fake autobiography. After living in isolation for many years, Howard Hughes held a highly uncommon press briefing in 1972 to challenge the validity of an autobiography rumored to be in the works. According to the New York Times, Hughes spoke with several reporters gathered in a conference room at the Sheraton Universal Hotel in Hollywood via phone from his getaway in the Bahamas. Hughes sought to make it evident that a book allegedly dictated by him was a forgery despite the fact that New York publishers claimed otherwise. In the end, the book turned out to be a massive hoax. Some of the reporters present were interested in Hughes' health and asked questions and stories about his allegedly compulsive conduct throughout the lengthy chat. 
quote, I certainly don't feel like running around the track at UCLA and trying to break a record, I can tell you that, Hughes said, but my health is tolerable, that's certain, and probably better than I deserve. According to the New York Times, Hughes was notoriously opposed to making public appearances and when forced to, would typically conduct them one-on-one -on -one from the rear seats of cars. Other tales have it that Hughes would frequently send out stand-ins to act as him when certain in-person meetings could not be avoided. On April 5, 1976, at the age of 70, Howard Hughes died aboard a private trip to Houston. He was estimated to be around 100 pounds with long hair and fingernails. His estate required some time to settle after his death, which was exacerbated by the appearance of many wills. In the end, the majority of his income was distributed among his cousins, two ex-wives, and various organizations, including the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. Surprisingly, at least one source indicates Howard Hughes did not die in 1976. Doug Wellman and Mark Music believe that after a decade of study and interviews with Eva McClelland, who claimed to have married Hughes in 1970, Hughes took the identity of a man associated to the CIA and died in 2001 at the age of 96. Fox's The Secret Life of Howard Hughes presents a profusion of evidence back to the assertion, which has been widely ridiculed by many who knew Hughes personally. It's great to know that you followed all the way through until the end. Remember to hit that like button and also subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell so that you're notified whenever we next upload valuable content like this. Thank you for your time and until next time, stay inspired.